upon the tree. Amazing pity, grace unknown, and love beyond degree. At the cross, at the cross, where I first saw the light, and the burden of my heart rode away. It was there by faith I received my sight, and now I am happy all the day. But drops of grief can never repay the debt of love I owe. Dear Lord, I give myself away. Tis all that I can do. At the cross, at the cross, where I first saw the light, and the burden of my heart rolled away. It was there by faith I received my sight, and now I am happy all the day. But the blood of Jesus, what can make me whole again? Nothing but the blood of Jesus. Oh, precious is the flow that makes me white as snow. Nothing but the blood of Jesus. For my part and this I see. Nothing but the blood of Jesus. For my cleansing, this my plea. Nothing but the blood of Jesus. Oh, precious is the flow that makes me white as snow. No other fount I know, nothing but the blood of Jesus. This is all my hope. And peace, nothing but the blood of Jesus. This is all my righteousness, nothing but the blood of Jesus. Oh, precious is the flow that makes me white as snow no other fount i know nothing but the blood of jesus amen last song be page number 374 we'll sing one two and four again 374 Go, come, drink, go the restless way. Send the light, send the light. There are souls to rescue, there are souls to save. Send the light, send the light, 
Send the light. Send the light. Send the light. Send the light. The blessed gospel light. Let it shine. Let it shine. From shore to shore. From shore to shore. Send the light. Send the light. The blessed gospel light. Let it shine. Let it shine. Forevermore. Forevermore. We have heard the Macedonian call today. Send the light. Send the light. Send the light, send the light, and a golden offering at the cross we lay. Send the light, 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 the blessed gospel light. Let it shine, let it shine, from shore to shore, from shore to shore. Send the light, send the light, the blessed gospel light. Let it shine, let it shine, forevermore, forevermore. Let us not grow weary in the work of love. Send the light, send the light. Send the light, send the light. Let us gather jewels for a crown above. Send the light, 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 send the light. The blessed gospel light. Let it shine, let it shine forevermore. Send the light, send the light. The blessed gospel light, let it shine, let it shine forevermore, forevermore. Let's uh. of the Lord today. Yeah. Seem like uh, bless us with a beautiful day today. Yeah. And let us have a little bit of rain yesterday. So uh, you know let's go ahead and take our Bibles and to those that are, are watching and those present as well, we are in Ephesians chapter five. And we pick up there in verse number 19. And we find in this, uh, Paul is telling the people, or instructing the people, commanding them, that uh, they need to uh, literally how they are supposed to be. In, uh, and he gives them a description of what spirit-filled worship looks like. There in verse uh, 19 it says, uh, verse 18 says, And be not drunk with wine wherein is excess, but be filled with the Spirit, speaking to yourselves in psalms and hymns and spiritual songs, singing and making melody in your heart to the Lord, giving thanks always for all things unto God and the Father in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ, submitting yourselves one to another in the fear of the Lord. So, but in verse 19, he is, he is describing to them what in verse 18, back up, they are called to be filled with the Spirit. And in verse 19, he is describing to them what if they are Spirit-filled, what Spirit-filled worship consists of. So we look at this and, and you know, we kind of, we left off uh, and we find that, you know, Paul, uh, he mentions three types 
of verbal expressions of worship that not only they are supposed to use, but we're supposed to use too. Because if, if, if it wasn't, if this wasn't good for us, it would be here. So we find it. First off, uh, there in verse uh, 19, he says, Speaking to yourselves in psalms and hymns and spiritual songs. So the very first expression that we see is from psalms. The word refers to literally Scripture set to music. And it's referring to the psalms of the Old Testament and to other ancient psalms that we uh, that we popular in the early church. Uh, the early church did not possess hymnals like we do, so they took the scrolls, the psalms, and they set them to music, singing them in their public gatherings. When our worship is spirit-filled and directed, He, the Lord, the Holy Spirit, will cause us to sing songs to one another that are based in Scripture. Every song we sing in the church should be biblical in its content. Now, not... It, it has to be, when we say biblical in content, every song should be laid aside alongside the Bible to ensure that it is accurate and doctrinally true. Okay? It doesn't mean that every hymn that we sing out of a hymnal has to be uh, a song that is set to music. But it does have to, it should be doctrinally and biblically sound. Uh, we should not sing a song just because it is a pleasant, catchy melody or because it's popular. We should sing only those songs that are scriptural and doctrinally accurate. When we sing songs that are scriptural, we reinforce the truths of the Bible. Psalms help us learn the Word of God. You know, a couple uh, that come to mind, for one is, is one that is written by Tom Hayes, and that's how excellent is thy name. Uh, which is musical rendering of Psalm 8. And the other one is by Mark Miller, and it is from the rising of the sun. And that is from Psalm 113. So, you know, we, we take, literally we can, we can take Scripture and turn it into song, put a melody to it and sing it, or we can literally, uh, it, if we sing in a hymn out of a hymnal, we ought to make sure that it is both doctrinally and biblically accurate. That, you know, there, there, there's nothing in there that's not the way it ought to be. Well, sometimes. But we still, just like the person bringing the message, we have to check whether the Spirit is right or not. You know? And the same with our songs that we sing. If we're using them in our worship service, then they ought to worship the Lord. Secondly, he talks about, he says... Uh, speaking to yourselves in psalms and hymns. Now, a hymn 
Basically, in the Greek language, the word refers to a song uttered in praise. Now, don't get me on this definition because it's the Greek definition of this. So it says, this word referred to a song uttered in praise of a God. In our case, it's of God. Alright? So, you know. It is a song of celebration. Literally, the word speaks of a song with religious content. So a hymn is a song written to celebrate God, His Son, Jesus Christ, and the Holy Spirit. Hymns are filled with religious content. They declare the glory of God. They speak of His salvation. They talk about the glories and the wonders of heaven. They describe His beauty. Hymns are songs that cause believers to celebrate the truth. So basically, when we are singing, we are singing, we sing hymns out of the hymnal, then we ought to be, when we are singing them, we ought to be celebrating our God. Okay, but sometimes... Man, you can be you can be up here and trying to lead a song, and boy, it seems like there ain't a lot of celebrating going on. This, uh, you know, here. But I mean, it's true. Y'all don't see it, but you be up here and you see it. But you know, there ought to be a celebrating. For one, we ought to be able to celebrate for the fact that we're able to go to church. And that we have a church as beautiful as we have to go to. And we have the freedom so far to go whenever we feel like it. So, you know, as as we do this, I mean... That ought, if anything at all, that ought to be a cause to celebrate. Hey, being able to get out of bed and put your feet on the ground and taking a breath, there ought to be enough to celebrate. Through the centuries, the church has used hymnals to teach truth. In the days when people did not own Bibles, preachers and talented people, they wrote hymns that were brimming with biblical truth. Even these songs, or when these songs were sung and memorized by the church, the folk in the church were educated in the truths of God's Word. There's a lot of truth from God's Word in a lot of hymns that we sing. You know, we are living in a time, sadly enough, when much modern music is shallow and devoid of biblical truth. You know, we ought to be able to thank God for the old hymns of the faith that teach us truth and doctrine. We need to thank God for the old hymns of the faith that reveal the glory of God. Songs like Amazing Grace and Rock of Ages, A Mighty Fortress. What about uh, There Is a Fountain or How Great Thou Art. All hail the power of Jesus' name. I mean, these are only a few, but but you stop and think. You get a hymn on. You look those up, and boy, you see you see biblical truth displayed in a song. Yeah. 
hundreds of others could be named. But just because the trend today is away from the doctrinally rich hymns of yesterday doesn't mean we have to abandon them. We make a choice of what we sing. And with that, in fact, we need to sing the great hymns of the faith. And we do. And I thank Jimmy for that. We need to sing more of them. We need to sing a greater variety of them. We need to learn them and teach them to a new generation. There are so many great hymns that are being neglected, forgotten, and swept from our memories. It's a shame that the church does not have a greater depth of love for the hymns of the faith. That's church in general. So I challenge us. April's coming up. Okay? April's coming up. Right? The first Sunday of April is this weekend. Sunday. Sunday. And I'm not talking about we got to do it Sunday. Okay, don't get me wrong. I'm just saying with the beginning of April. Alright, let's commit ourselves here at Calvary to learning and sharing the great hymns of the past. And the only way that we can share them is by sharing them with each other to begin with. And the only way we can do that, I would propose that we learn a new hymn every month. I mean, we can sing our regular old song, but we need to, we need to, in our service, we need to sing a new hymn, one hymn, and we we sing that new song through the through the month, so that we can learn it. You know, we sing, we take a hymnal, we take a hymnal, and and we we thumb through it and we find the one. Hey, I know how this goes. Well, let's find one that we don't know how it goes, or maybe one that we haven't sung for a long. Like here's page one thirty four, right? In in this in this in song stirring, soul stirring songs and hymns, my anchor holds. You know, we ought to be able to to sing that. We pretty much know something about it. Well. I mean, we can. It, we we're not going to get it perfect. Hey, I understand that because we don't have a piano player. But you know, I still say that when when we we look and we do it, we ought to be able to uh, come up some way. I mean, we got technology. We got Bluetooth. I got a Bluetooth speaker. I mean, we can set it up here or we can run it through our sound deal up here. I mean, and Bluetooth the music. So at least we got something, you know. I think that, I think we could, I think we could learn a new song. I mean, 312, I mean, it's not too bad. Open my eyes that I may see. Or whatever. But anyway, I just challenge us that we learn one new hymn a month. And just think, by the end of the year, that's 12 new hymns that we can add to our great repertoire and be able to sing. You know, we have a book. We got books. We got a first edition, second edition. Got a soul stirring song in that's full of hymns. So let's try to learn. Them. 
And we can add them to the great scriptural songs that we do sing. Yeah, yeah. Got boxes of them upstairs. If we did. So let's just commit ourselves to learning and singing songs that celebrate God, His Word, His salvation, His Son, and all that God represents. Amen? And next, what does is, what is verse 19 say? Speaking to yourselves in psalms and hymns and spiritual songs. So Paul, the, the third verbalization is a spiritual song. It refers to soulful music. This would include courses, maybe lighter arrangements, and even some popular music to an extent. You know what about, uh, there's just something about that name? God is so good. His name is wonderful. They all fall into that category. So would songs like There's Coming a Day, I'd Rather Have Jesus, New Grace, Farther Along, Thanks to Calvary, just to name a few. Sometimes these songs hang around for a generation or two and then they fade away. Others endure through the ages. These songs serve to lift our hearts in joy and adoration to the, of the Lord. They help us to articulate the joy and love that we feel for the Lord in our hearts. So basically, spirit-filled worship involves those who know the Lord, the Lord singing songs that honor and glorify Him. The music of the church should be intensely biblical. We are not seeing something that goes against the teachings of the Bible. Just because you like a song doesn't mean it should be sung in the house of God. You know? And if it isn't based in Scripture glorifying to the Lord or edifying to the church, it's got no place in our worship. I mean, there's... I think, just like I thank Jimmy for, for taking time and leading us in, in these hymns and things, I thank Lori that she goes through what she does. Thank goodness she went through that one CD that we bought. <laughs> that we mistakenly took for something else. <laughs> you know, it would be like, yeah, here it is. And then, wow. But she'll sit up back here and she'll, she'll go through songs to find the songs and things. And you know, most of the time they go with whatever is being presented from the pulpit. And I have nothing to do with any of that unless I ask for a special song. And that's, song. And that's usually done after the, the offer. Because I, it, it ties into something that I'm going to speak about. You know, most of the time we, we're pretty much online together. And we got nothing to do with that. We just give it to the Lord, you know. Uh, we need to be on guard when it comes to the music we sing and allow to be sung in our church. I mean, I sat up here, did a message at a funeral service, and they walked in and uh, wanted this song played, and we looked at it. We told them that already that we didn't, and they said, no, it's, it's fine. And it, it was right at the last moment. We didn't have time to check it, 
And when we played it, it wasn't fine. And, you know, I got I got other preachers sitting in the deal looking like, I can't believe you're, you know. And I didn't have anything new. And, you know, boy, I was irritated. Just like some things that need that are presented, whether we're in a a, a wedding service or, or a funeral service or church service of some kind, revival, or whatever, you know, there there are some things that that are appropriate, and there are those things that aren't appropriate. That I've had to say, no, but we're not doing that. It's not, it's not going to be passed out in here. Just because. But you know, we we need to, uh, and I, I, you know, just like there are some things that are trying to take place in here. A lady wants to bring her dog in here during the wedding. Hey, that dog's going to have to wait outside. Well, what do you want me to do with it? Stick it in a car. I don't care what you do with it, but it's not coming in here. And it wasn't, it, it wasn't a service dog either. This was just a little foo-foo thing and some little pink purse looking job. And I'm, you know, some of those things, I mean, I made people mad about it, but that's the way it goes. You know, they'll get over it. You know, I want to say that there are not not all new songs are evil. I don't think that either. We hear the word contemporary a lot. And the word simply means new. There was a day when Amazing Grace was a contemporary song at one time. Simply because it was new. The age of a song should not be the primary criteria by which we judge it. We should take a song and place it alongside the Bible and ask, is it biblical? Does it preach the gospel? Does it bring glory to the Lord? Does it edify the church? Does it teach eternal truth? Consider the actual music that accompanies the words. Is it the type of music that belongs in church? There's a lot of music out there that's being presented with word and just because the word, the, the songs the words of the song may mention Jesus or Holy Spirit or God in the words doesn't mean they ought to be played in church the way the music is. There's nothing that separates that music from what someone may hear Saturday night somewhere. And I mean, I'm sorry, but I believe it's true. Or when the music is a lot louder than the words, you can't tell what the words say. There are many new songs that are fine for your car radio or for your home that don't have any business in church. I believe that all of our music should be scriptural, uplifting, and edifying. And it should bring glory to God. It should teach truth. It should not sound or feel like it belongs in the world. And I thank God that around here we, we hadn't had to worry about all that. And when I say that, I'm not just talking about some music that sounds like uh, it ought to, it, it came off a concert stage, you know. I'm talking about the so-called Christian music sounds a lot like uh, 
honky tonk music. You know, I'm not. A, uh, I like some country music. I don't like some of it. And I'm, I, I like a lot of southern gospel music, but there's some of that I don't like it. You know, I like the hymns, and I like uh, uh, songs and music that, that just uplift the soul, that make you want to, to come to church, make you want to celebrate, hey, I'm saved, I believe in God. And you know, our music ought to, ought to help us to celebrate that fact. You know, if it, if it sounds like the word, I think it ought to be left in the world. I mean, we try to listen to those things that I would want to, that could be played in the church. If it glorifies God, then bring it into the church and let's sing it. But if it doesn't, then we don't need it. Ultimately, it's a decision that's best left between the individual and the Lord, unless it's in the church. It's a decision left between a church and the Lord. We should never judge others just because they use music that we would reject, that we don't like. But we have the responsibility to guard against the introduction of music that we find offensive in the church. I mean, there. I, I've seen a lot of, of these uh, down through the, the years. Some of these heavy metal bands and their lead singers and the, the and stuff that have come to know the Lord supposedly, and then they try to they try to to put their the Lord to their music. And I mean, to me, that just don't work. But we're not, we don't need to miss the intent of the writer either of what Paul's trying to get them to understand. He wants us to know that all kinds of musical expression have their place in the worship of God. He also wants us to know that a spirit field will always manifest itself in the singing of psalms and hymns and spiritual songs. So we're going to stop right there because I can't go into the other. So we're going to be looking next at the depth of Spirit-filled worship. So you can read into the last part of verse 19 and verse 20 if you want to do a little pre-thinking on that. Uh, For those that are watching on YouTube, uh, we're going into our prayer bulletin now. So I hope and I ask that you are praying. I'd uh, surely uh, like to know you are and would definitely, definitely uh, like to see you here in the church if you can. So I look forward to seeing you sometime. <laughs>